my dream, my childhood home is a burning bright white. I'm running away from the blaze, the windows filled with smoke, flames licking higher and higher up the sides of the house. I wake up to my phone buzzing. It's Ashley, my childhood best friend. I flip it open to hear her say, there's a fire near your house. The thing is, I'm not at that house. Actually, no one is. The entire family is in Oregon for a reunion. Technically, we're safe, but our house, the house I grew up in, isn't. Ashley's voice is so calm, and it's confusing to me because she's never calm. She's been my next door neighbor and best friend since the day she was born, and she is never not neurotic. She operates on anxiety level 100 roughly 99% of the time. The fact that she sounds so unbothered right now makes me feel like either she's lying about a fire or maybe I really don't need to worry. It's not a big deal or anything, but do you want me to grab anything out of your house just in case, she asks? Sorry, I just woke up. What? I can go grab stuff from your house just to be safe. It's fine, though. We organize a quick plan for her to get some of our things, then hang up. I go upstairs to find my parents drinking coffee. I can tell they're mentally bracing for the arrival of all of our eccentric family members who will be here in a few hours' time. They're slowly and quietly cleaning the kitchen, and I can tell that no other neighbor has notified them, which feels strange. Ashley just called, I say. There's a fire. My father looks at me with a distinct fear in his eyes that I'll never forget. Then he shoots off a phrase which he let slip only once I was in college. You're shitting me. <laughs> there are two things you'll need to know for context at this point. One, I grew up in the boonies. Boonies is in middle of the forest where you should never plan on getting cell phone reception. Boonies as in we all have our own generators because trees knock out power lines multiple times each winter. Boonies as in my brother decided to learn how to smoke meat and he actually kept the pelts to sew together and no one even reacted to this news around the dinner table. <laughs> Perhaps you've heard of the town where I'm from, but odds are extremely high that you haven't. Bonnie Dune. Even the name reeks of rural backwoods, as it should, because when I say town, I'm being generous. There are four standing establishments for residents to visit, a school, a church, a firehouse, and a winery. So when I say fire, I don't mean one house is on fire. I mean an entire forest is on fire in the Santa Cruz Mountains while we're all just sitting in Oregon drinking coffee. The second thing you should know is that our property and house is the most deeply sacred part of our family identity. My parents built it themselves, which took two years and involved a lot of bribes of pizza and beer to convince friends to come and help. It was the house I was born in and the only home I've ever known. All of my neighbors have been the same since the day I was born. There's something really strange and special about growing up in the middle of nowhere, especially in the way it veritably forces you to cling to any source of entertainment. Growing up, my friends and I needed each other. We needed someone to find adventure with, since Forrest was all we had. While all of our families raised us differently, all Bonnie Dune parents did have one thing in common, a totalitarian level of restriction on screen time. Living with a limit of only 20 minutes of TV a day, if we were lucky, we came to equate television with the sweet, sweet nectar of the gods. <laughs> we wanted nothing more than to engage in brain-rotting, tongue-lolling, drool-inducing TV marathons. But we couldn't, so we had to become resourceful. We spent most of our childhood finding creative ways of passing the time in nature. Sometimes that meant drying fruit in our junky old dehydrator. Sometimes that meant pretending we were going to run away and devising a plan for how we would survive in the wild. And for three of my friends, sometimes that meant falling off my family's rope swing and breaking their arm. We also spent a lot of time digging around for bones. <laughs> sometimes people ask me what I was like as a child, and the answer is pretty strange. In case you weren't aware, forest kids love decomposition. 
We were obsessed with it in a way that would now make adults at parties very uncomfortable. <laughs> One year, we found the fibula of a deer in the woods that had been clearly gnawed off by some sort of predator. And my parents didn't blink an eye or put up any signs of protest when I simply bagged it up and brought that bad boy in for third grade show and tell. <laughs> Growing up surrounded by redwoods and nothing else, these are the childhood antics we resorted to. Ashley was always a part of these weird adventures, so it felt strangely fitting that she was the one warning me that all those acres of woods were now in danger of being destroyed. With the murmuring of the words, there's a fire near the house, I flicked the first domino that quickly knocked down all the rest. Perhaps because I wasn't fully awake, perhaps because I hadn't touched a sip of coffee, perhaps because I was in some sort of shock, I was not prepared for the maelstrom of panic that ensued. My father began furiously typing the numbers of neighbors in his archaic cell phone, trying to obtain more details than the vague ones I had been given. Not long after that, all the calls poured in. My father has a long history of horrible ringtones. For example, right now it's the sound of a train whistling. He doesn't like trains. He's never been interested in trains. On this day, it was set to the worst possible ringtone for the situation, Beethoven's Fifth. <laughs> this is never something that any human should ever set as their ringtone, but especially on a day where every phone call could be the one that's telling you that your house is gone. <laughs> There's nothing to better wrench you from minor worry to a blind, sweaty underarm type of panic than hearing the da 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 <laughs> as a means of relaying what is bound to be bad news. He stepped outside to begin answering these calls from our bevy of friendly mountain neighbors, perhaps as a way of protecting us, but it was too late. The air was heavy and thick with anxiety. I began to feel a weight in my stomach as I watched my father pacing on the front lawn of the house, where we were about to host the reunion. I could tell by his stance and frantic gesticulations that he was not feeling cool or casual about this. Like seeing a parent cry, there was something deeply unsettling about knowing that your dad is as afraid as you are of what may be coming. People have asked me why we decided to stay in Oregon, but the reality was the fire was either going to rip through or be put out by the time we got home, even if we left immediately. Not only that, but my family hadn't been together in over a decade, so it made this, big, this family reunion a big deal. We decided to stay. Looking back on it, the day is a blur of behavior that is laughably typical for the Malcolm clan. At the time, it was all a bizarre minor distraction from the looming acknowledgement that we might not have a home to go back to. There was the strained disgust on my mother's face as family members arrived with jello salad, ambrosia salad, and all types of mayonnaise-based dishes. <laughs> Vegetable lovers, they were not. There was my boyfriend, clearly wondering what he got himself into, especially with my intensely glass half empty aunt who when discovering he was from Davis said, oh Davis, I had a horse that I loved so much and he died there. <laughs> Living in Davis was one of the worst times of my life. There was the tension between siblings that always exists as allegiances come to the light when everyone finds themselves in the same room, all of which was punctuated by the repetitive da 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 of my father's cell phone. My dad revealed very little to us, other than he thought it would be best if we left early in the, the next morning. During all of this, the only thing keeping me grounded was how unbothered Ashley had been by all of this. If Ashley said it wasn't a big deal, it really wasn't a big deal. We took off before dawn. The drive home, which is always torturously long, felt as though it would drag forever in a tense silence. Nearing dusk, we finally made it back to Santa Cruz, and as we began to drive up the mountains, a thick fog began to roll in. Except it wasn't fog, because it began to dust the windshield and cake grime onto the side mirrors. It was ash. The reality of the damage began to hit me. No one wanted to speak. While the silence felt abnormal and painful, speaking would force us to voice what we were all fearing. Losing loved ones will always be worse than losing possessions. But does the land you grow up on count as a loved one? 
They say that losing your home causes nearly as much grief as a death, and I believe it. While I spent so much of my youth hating my secluded existence, who I am has been irrevocably developed by the wilderness I was raised in and those wild banshees I was raised with. How would I be able to establish a new reality that didn't involve our creek, the treehouse my dad built for me in a grove of redwoods, or the fields of daisies I used to run through pretending to be a princess? I am those woods, and I never won't be the girl who frets every time someone leaves the water running while they brush their teeth, or who asks things like, what kind of fern do you think that is on a hike? <laughs> Bonnie Doon made me that, and the people I grow up with know me with an intensity that no one ever will because we lived that reality together. Nearing our absurdly long driveway, it felt like we had reached the end of days. There were charred trees, the pink Pepto-Bismol splotches of fire retardant dropped from helicopters, all signage making clear that some not-so-far neighbors of ours had been evacuated overnight. By the time we got to a neighbor's house, where our cars were parked and covered in black grit, it was very obvious that our house, that house built by my strong father and my kick-ass mother with their own hands, had been mere acres away from destruction. But the fire was contained. We were allowed to return home, though encouraged to stay inside. 48 hours ago, I had stumbled out of a dream that now felt eerily similar to the nightmare that lay at my feet. What the fuck was my initial reaction when I saw Ashley? The fire was at our back doorstep. Oh, I know, she replied, <laughs> holding up her phone with an image that was clearly the blaze coming up on her backyard. Want to see pictures of how close it was? We had to evacuate. <laughs> Why did you tell me it was fine? Rolling her eyes, she looked at me like it was the most obvious thing in the world. Because I knew how freaked out you would be about it. And you were so far away, there was nothing you would be able to do. She immediately went back to her TV show, and the conversation was over. <laughs> it took a while for me to understand what true beauty came out of that day. Not only was it the realization of what gratitude should be felt for every moment in which the people, things, and memories we hold dear are safe, but also the gratitude I hold for the fucking epic whimsy of the childhood I had and the stability and love that my childhood home has held for me. That day was a love letter to my hometown, my best friend, and my parents for raising me in what I used to call a devastating hellhole of boredom. But most of all, it was a love letter to that hellhole of boredom, which I now see as sacred, my forest that almost burned down. Caitlin Malcolm, everybody!